speak a little loudly, but can everyone hear me? Yes. Right. Great. Um, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is actually a really exciting panel. Uh, the gentlemen I have here with me are outstanding market practitioners, and this is going to be a really interesting discussion. Um, so, I think the format we're going to go on is that everyone's going to present for about 15 minutes. Uh, and at the end of each presentation, we'll take a few seconds of questions or a few minutes of questions, either among <coughs> the panelists or from the audience. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have a much more involved discussion. And uh, yeah, I think it'll be great. I'm going to let my, my fellow panelists introduce themselves. So, so I'll start from my right. Uh, I'm Good Brad I? Haddon from Alphadine Asset Management in New York. Uh, Chris Krasik, Jaroslawski Fraser in uh, Toronto. We're, uh, I guess, medium sized money manager. Uh, Patrick Green, Euro Pacific Asset Management, based in Puerto Rico. Um, we are a long only equity fund, um, smaller in AUM relative to some of these guys here. Hi, I'm Sanjeev Sharma, most recently uh, a partner at AVM. And uh, I'm a Mario Monti, I'm at the Grant the Mail on Otterloo, and uh, uh, prior to that I was in the U.S. Treasury in the Office of Debt Management. So, okay, uh, I guess we're going to start with Patrick, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and proceed. So, the floor is yours. Yeah, you can take it off of that, that's fine. You can pop it off. Yeah, sure. Yeah. is more fun, right? Just take the whole thing. You, you can pop it off, yeah, that's fine. There you go. There we go. Uh, again, Patrick Green, Euro Pacific Asset Management. Before I say anything, I just want to give a quick little disclosure. Uh, everything up here is my own opinion, nothing of my firm. Uh, I'm not giving any in investment advice, uh, so I just want to get that clear. Um, so after that disclosure, I have one other to make. I should definitely not be here speaking. Um, I mean, compared to these guys and, and all the other panelists, this is an amazing event. Uh, Stephanie Kelton and everyone here has done a great job. And I am definitely unqualified to speak on this. But I am qualified to talk about how I found MMT. And I think that's, that's really important. So one of the questions that was posed to the panel is, uh, how can investors help advance the ideas of MMT? And when I first saw this, I was like, well, as an investor, selfishly, I kind of hope nobody knows about MMT. Um, for some of these other guys, they know it too, because some of the, the things that I've learned make investing a little bit easier. Um, and again, selfishly, it, as an investor, it, it helps me if less people know about it. So, but as a citizen, uh, I think it's very important, and it's very important for policy, policy decisions. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll give some thoughts on it. Yesterday, I was listening to um, a podcast with Ray Dalio, who just printed uh, his book of his principles that he's had over the last 30 years. Uh, so going back to selfish investors, he kept those a secret until he's a billionaire, and now he's opening up. Um, but one, one of the main ones is pain plus reflection equals progress. Um, I'll let you read that on your own. But, but the point being, you have to fail, reflect on what went wrong, and get better. And that's how you progress. And that's kind of how I've gotten here. So let me take a step back. And that's, that's kind of been a, you know, something throughout my whole life. So I think for anyone is, to get better, they have to fail first and improve. In sports, it's easy. I grew up playing sports my whole life. Playing basketball, you take a shot, you miss, you make an adjustment, you shoot, you miss, make an adjustment, finally hit your shot. And then you get better and you progress. In economics, it's a little bit more difficult. I was at a firm um, doing sell-side equity research uh, a little company called Lehman Brothers, in uh, 2008 when that blew up. And I had I'd paid zero attention to the macroeconomics. I was looking at, you know, where the wire lines of a sprint were in Kansas. And after that happened, pain, I, I reflected back and, you know, I have a master's in international economics and looked back at my textbooks, followed some of the, the brightest minds in economics, uh, some of the main hedge fund managers and saw what they were saying about the economy and what was going to happen. And I ended up joining a, a firm that, that reflected some of those views. So that was my reflection and I thought I had progressed. So in 2010, I, I basically agreed with this. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, this letter, uh, but it was signed by some 
pretty prominent economists and hedge fund managers. Uh, but one of the main points was that QE was going to deba debase the dollar, lead to inflation, and fail to promote employment. So my reflection, this is the progress I got to on that. Well, here was the outcome of that. So green arrow is when that letter was sent. That's the US dollar in the red. That's the Fed's balance sheet in the white. So the US dollar actually didn't really debase. Uh, this is CPI, Fed's balance sheet. Went up and down, but basically right where it was seven years ago. So didn't get the inflation. And then here's the unemployment. So we have Fed's balance sheet and unemployment just falling like crazy. Again, I didn't necessarily invest based on this view, but being wrong and seeing these charts causes me to reflect because there's a lot of pain here. And then again, it progressed. And so my progression you know, got me out of the, the traditional economics textbooks and got me on the blogs. Uh, and I followed, started following a couple of people that are here. So I found this guy, uh, Warren Mosler, who's sitting up front over here. Uh, I wish I had read that in 2008, but, or saw this video in 2008, but missed it. Uh, found this gentleman, who I haven't seen yet, but he's around here somewhere. Uh, and then found this young lady, who's put on this conference again, has done a great job. But uh, again, wish I would have found this. So this was my reflection. And, and getting here to where I'm at now has been my progression. Over the last four or five years, the concepts that they've, they've taught have really helped me a lot. Um, I won't talk about my specific personal strategies or anything like that, but things have made a lot more sense understanding MMT. So getting back to the original question, how can investors help advance the ideas of MMT? <coughs> That's tough to do. I, I think the, the bottom line is it's, it's people have to you know, follow pain plus reflection equals progress and just get better. And, and I don't know if teachers can instill that in, into students or... Uh, you know, parents to children. But for me, it was lose money, you have to progress or you don't have a job. Uh, again, in academia and policy, it's a little bit different. You know, maybe someday it'll be you're, you're losing an election and you don't have a job, so that's your pain and you gotta progress. Um, so I'll just leave with this, this quote from this, this JFK speech in 62, which is an awesome speech. Everyone should read it. And the biggest one is, uh, we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. And Again, getting back to sports, that's easy because you work out, you can feel, you know, feel the change, but thinking is very difficult. You don't, you don't feel your change, you just resort back to what you know. So anyways, I um, hope that makes a little bit of sense and thank you very much. Uh, that's difficult. I, so for me, I, my, my firm has a very specific investment strategy and so, and we stick to that. And so when our clients come to this, to us, we explain to them what our investment strategy is and they're there for that specific reason. Um, it, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, it's, it's basically like trying to reteach people, you know, how to ride a bike. Um, but, but for me, it, it hasn't been that hard because, again, we have a, a very specific strategy. So I'm, I'm sure these guys have a better answer for you than that. Yeah, any thoughts to the other panels on that? Or, well, I think it makes you look smarter. <laughs> but when you're presenting to clients, I mean, I'm on the fixed income side, and then you're presenting something that's very different. And I find when you present to people outside the business, people who run their own businesses and things like that, they get it way earlier than your own bond team gets. So the, when you explain to people like that and their potential clients for a while, they go, this is really smart. That is talking a lot different than the other guys, and it makes sense. So that's, I, I find it's a competitive advantage. And I share your thoughts about not sharing it with everybody. <laughs> But, you know, until you do, but it is, for, for a money manager, I think it's an advantage. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, a lot of the clients I'm, I'm dealing with are more on the retail end. 
So it's a, it's a bit of a different conversation to have. Yeah, we have like a quarter of our book is high net worth retail, so we get, we get those clients as well. But when you're presenting to investment committees, whether it's universities or uh, pension plans, um, you know, it, it strikes a chord as well. Right. Because there's typically, they're not all market people or economists or anything like that. I believe uh, there's a question. Yeah. Why does the investor class seem to want to balance budget? Is it because they think the price of you know, bonds and stuff would be affected deleteriously? I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think it's the same as. They should know better. Yeah, I think it's the same as policymakers. Um, well, they don't know better. Yeah, well, I, I, I think higher people who are actually managing money um, are indifferent to what happens. It's more a question of, okay, if this happens, then this is how I'll react. Um, so it's not a matter of getting involved, and, and, and it, it's just re reactionary to whatever policymakers so it's, do. It's sort of the, 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 the beauty contest point of, I don't, if, if the budget isn't balanced, then a certain number of people will be scared and they'll react a certain way. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if, you know, if, you're right, the, uh, uh, yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. I mean, it's just reactionary to whatever policymakers decide, and you know, not trying to get involved in the, in the politics at all. But most of the investment community seems to think that large budget deficits, $14 trillion or whatever it is, is going to lead to, at some point, to some rapid increase in interest rates. And, and that's going to affect the bond market dramatically. It's going to get and, the and, uh, So, I mean, I can't imagine why anybody is, is buying bonds these days when people are so worried that, that interest rates are going to skyrocket because of the deficit. Yeah, I'll talk about that in my presentation. Okay, well, you can answer that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have a couple of really, really good fixed income All right, on this panel. And, like that, and that's, that's going to come up again, again, thematically throughout this panel. So, um, yeah, we're still good. Yeah. So I've worked with individual investors like mom and pop people. And um, my, my, my concern the last 20 years is, is more on the, the leadership level of financial people like yourself. It, it, uh, you've just come across this just like the rest of us more recently. But I feel really let down by the, the corporate leaders in the financial service industry that market that they're making a difference for people and we've got these products and services that really are for your benefit and then they really like you just said we don't really care <laughs> you know what policies decisions all we need to know is what they are so we know how to you know do something yeah on that last one pers personally well, it's not I'm, that I'm i don't care I'm not, it's just I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not involved in the policy decisions and whatever congress or president does then I have to respond to that. So it's just right. to do my job, and I, you know, and for me, I'm you know I'm just a little worker bee, and 99.9 percent .9 are not up there. Um, and in my previous job at Lehman Brothers, all I did was look at U.S. telecom companies. You know, until the day we went bankrupt, I had no idea that was going to happen. I didn't know what was going on. Um, so I, I can't answer for for people at the top, but most people are you know just doing their jobs. So like the industries. I think the industries had growth, the investment management industries had growth for a long period of time. And that growth isn't there anymore. Now it's mature. It's much more competitive. So I think you're going to get more critical thinking in the industry going forward. I will it takes a long time. We have a question right there. Yeah, so you do equities. And uh, the Fed just announced on Wednesday it's about to start shrieking its balance <coughs> sheet. It seems like you still hear a lot of people saying, well, you know, this is what's been propping up the equity market for the last however many years. And so there's, you know, concern about that now. Are you able to talk about what kind of conversations you're having around that? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, some of the views is what you just said, right? QE pushed equities up, so removing QE is going to push equities down. And, and my view is always, well, you know, they're either raising rates or lowering rates because of the environment. They're, they're, the Fed's reactionary to what's going on, right? So they, they raised rate or they lowered rates when stocks were crushed and they were going to keep rates down until stocks went up. And so that's basically what happened. 
And so it, it wasn't, maybe QE did it, I don't know, but the Fed was driven by trying to get stocks up. I mean, they said, Bernanke said that in 2010, that's what he wanted to do is get asset prices higher. Now, I, personally, I think, um, I think they can keep raising rates and it won't be an issue. Um, but I, I think they, they, wanna, they wanna slow down the equity market. I think the valuations, they think valuations are maybe too high. And that's why you saw, I, th I think when they, they announced um, that they're gonna shrink the balance sheet, they said that they're gonna raise again basically in December. So lift the front end, but then they also dropped their long run forecast for the Fed funds rate. So they basically dropped their curve on what they're gonna do. And all, all these guys talk about it more, this is just my own opinion. And, and I think the point of that is if you raise rates in the short term, you kind of slow down some financial speculation, but you keep rates stable at the long end and it helps the real economy. So I, I think that's, that's kind of what they're doing is they're, they're worried about just, you know, disrupting the real economy, but kind of want to slow down some financial speculation. So I, I don't know, you know what happens with equities because it could be that them taking care of the real economy drives earnings and profits and then equities you know, valuations you know roll into that or that they disrupt that financial speculation and something happens it's kind of a long answer and there was really nothing to I, it I, so I, i'm sorry I, I assure you there's going to be more yeah yeah these guys these have a better answer than me coming out with the federal reserves on of their balance sheet so yeah your, your question is also going to be yeah, and for, for me on that question, it's more of a, like a currency issue because I look at more international markets. Okay. Um, and so I, the Fed, you know, they, they're reducing their balance sheet while the Bank of Japan's holding theirs down, the ECB as well. Um, but I personally think the Fed's getting closer to ending their in tightening cycle, whereas the ECB's maybe just beginning their tightening cycle. And I think that's been something that's helped out the euro this year. These guys will completely disagree, but... Well, and Warren will just say it's all current account surplus. <laughs> well, I, I think I think that wraps up half this okay. segment, and uh, we're going to move on to uh, to Glenn Haddon. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um. <clears throat> my name is Glenn Haddon. Um. I am a hedge fund manager uh, in New York. Um, I guess if you Googled me, um, leave out the part of the uh, uh, Gatorade fueled trading rampage quote in the Wall Street Journal. Um, but um, people would probably say that I'm have been the biggest trader of government bonds uh, in the world in the last decade and a half. So I guess as a practitioner standpoint, my expertise is uh, how governments um, have tended to operate in the kind of zero lower uh, rate bound constraints um, because they're using um, other tools, specifically sovereign bonds, government bonds, as a tool now of monetary policy. And so I've given this speech where monetary theory um, has been kind of a center point, and I've given it to, I mean, I've probably given it 100 times, um, around the world, Asia, Europe, US, Canada, uh, South America to central bankers, politicians, other policy makers, uh, investors, uh, etc. And um, I'd like to start with, with this slide here um, because there's a, a fundamental misunderstanding um, around debt. Um, you know, if you told someone I'm going to have a balanced budget, that sounds, um, that sounds actually kind of prudent, kind of smart. Um, but from a government standpoint, it's maybe not always the case. So I always like to put this slide up here because for those of you who have kids, um, you know that Sully. Um, from Monsters, Inc. may look really, really scary, but once you get to know Sully, he's actually not. So that's the kind of point of this, is that um, having a government deficit or a government debt growing um, may sound scary, um, but maybe it's not. And the reason why it sounds scary is just because of the way we were taught in classic textbooks, right? But it doesn't mean it's right, right? Just because you taught something doesn't mean it's actually correct. Right, so you know, back in the 1960s, 1970s, I, you know, my my as your dentist, I recommend you smoking viceroys, um, or smoke a cigarette as your doctor because it relaxes your throat. So just because you're taught something, doesn't mean it's right. And this is the kind of message I'm trying to get across to um, these investors, policymakers, politicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And unfortunately, um, I'm either uh, implicitly booed out of the room, subtly booed out of the room, or or, or quite uh, vocally booed out of the room, depending who I'm speaking to. So. The challenge we have as, as practitioners um, is defending our views, which you know I think I'm right, and, and my, my professional track record would, would prove it as such, um, against people who are otherwise highly credible 
um, but who are just tragically misinformed. And I'm not saying that you know, President Trump is, is the most highly credible person or not, but he's showing a slide um, that shows uh, government debt and the speech actually talked about how the U.S. was on a path to bankruptcy under President Obama's speeches. But, you know, fortunately, President Obama is not much better. Um, this is actually Senator Obama um, talking about why he was not going to vote to increase the debt limit back in, uh, I believe it was 2006, um, because uh, it uh, actually talked about impacting our children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the point I'm making is that um, what we battle against as market practitioners um, is a school of thought that is well entrenched, and the problem is it comes from otherwise very, very highly credible people, not just obviously politicians, but some of the smartest and most successful and wealthiest people in the world. Um, you know, I put Bill Gates and Warren Buffett up here, who both talk about in various speeches um, why uh, deficits are going to lead to bad things and why they should actually be reduced. So as a market practitioner of MMT, um, that's the constant battle we have. And so um, uh, you'll see it now on CNBC. If you watch it over the course of the day from 8 a.m. until 5 o'clock, you'll see at least one person talking about this, whether it's a bond market professional or more likely an equity market or credit professional, how the U.S. is on a road to, um, uh, we call it insolvency, fiscal ruin, higher taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So I pulled a couple of case studies that are really kind of illustrative from my career as to you know, why the MMT practice is beneficial in terms of how you think about opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. And this kind of came up a moment ago. Um, this is a graph that you're going to see, uh, if you haven't seen it in the last two days since the Federal Reserve uh, announced the shrinking of the balance sheet, uh, their balance sheet on Wednesday, um, you're going to see this over the next week or two as to why um, the stock market is going to come to a cataclysmic end because not only is the balance sheet stopped growing, it's actually, actually going to be shrinking. And so, you know, the message I kind of give to people is like, every day for 47 years, um, I've woken up in the morning, and every day that I've woken up in the morning, the sun's gone up. It doesn't mean that my waking up has caused the sun to rise, right? There's such a thing as coincidence and such a thing as causality, right? And that's the big mis misunderstanding here. Um, the equity market participants like to think that what drives the equity market is the size of the Fed's balance sheet. Um, it could be true, but you know, there's also the composition aspect. Um, if the Fed were to shrink its balance sheet by 50% by selling all its short-dated treasuries and to reinvest the proceeds of that, let's say half of that, in the equity market, well, <laughs> the balance sheet is down by half of the stock market if they're going to be buying two trillion of equities, it's not going down. <laughs> So, so this is the kind of the, the biggest kind of misinformation campaign you're going to be getting, um, and you'll see it as a practitioner. Um, too important to understand, you know, what is kind of true and what is not true, and that's why MMT is is a kind of very valuable. Um, a second aspect, I'm not sure you can quite read this up here, but um, if you recall, in August of 2011, um, Standard and Poor's downgraded uh, the U.S. government debt from AAA to AA high, um, and so if you can see on the top chart is a graph of the S&P, and you kind of see from kind of March, April, May, June, July, it kind of goes sideways. Um, and then it falls precipitously in August of 2011, right around the time of the downgrade. So now, whenever we talk about a credit rating event in the United States, the first thing that happens is the stock market gets sold, right? So as a market practitioner, especially related to government bonds and government debt, um, I've yet to find any person, um, and that goes from my career as um, uh, a person who dialogued with investors uh, at Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, uh, as well as having <coughs> a large client base right now, um, there's no reaction function uh, whether the U.S. is rated AAA or AA or BBB or whatever. Um, <coughs> what pe people fail to realize is that as, if you recall, in July of 2011, when we were debating, uh, is there going to be a deal, is there not going to be a deal, the John Boehner grand bargain, President Obama being the adult in the room, all this nonsense back and forth that dominated the news cycle, that in July of 2011, in the bottom chart, this is a graph of uh, the credit default swap indice, if you can quite see it, of, uh, of the Republic of Italy. Um, and you can see that uh, it's starting in kind of late June through the month of July of 2011, um, Italy credit default swaps widened out by 250 basis points. Um, Italy basically put itself, or the market put it, Italy, uh, on a road to, um, uh, to insolvency. You had basically you had the makings or you had the initiation of a sovereign debt crisis in Europe. Um, that's why the stock market sold off. It just happened to be the stock market was not focusing 
on the right thing. It was focusing on this grand bargain nonsense of will the debt ceiling get raised, will the US default, blah, 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 and missed a much bigger picture. So um, as a practitioner, what I would suggest is if um, you start hearing because of debt ceiling issues that the, uh, the U US government is going to be put on credit watch. I think Fitch actually mentioned this two weeks ago before um, President Trump and the Democratic leadership talked about pushing off the uh, October uh, end date uh, into, into December. Um, uh, if this were to happen, there's no reaction function. Um, there's no reason to stock, sell the stock markets. And if people do, you probably want to buy it, all things equal. Um, <clears throat> next, uh, what MMT was very helpful with, and uh, I think this will come up again in our panel, is understanding um, uh, what exactly is quantitative easing and what are its implications. Okay, so the reason why I put this graph up, and this graph is actually the average maturity of U.S. government debt in months. Okay, so you go back to, I think it starts in 2006, I believe, 2004. Um, it kind of held steady at around 50 months, which is roughly the average it's been uh, over the last 50 or 60 years. Um, dipped briefly in 2008 and has gone up uh, ever since uh, the start of 2009. What's important to understand is, yes, quantitative easing, right, um, uh, was uh, the, U, uh, the, the Federal Reserve buying U.S. Treasuries and replacing them with effectively bank reserves. But the U.S. government, the Treasury Department, was actually increasing the amount of long-dated treasuries they were actually uh, selling to the marketplace. So the point you would actually say is that, yes, quantitative easing actually removed bonds from the market, but the Treasury Department put them right back in. So, so the, the inference you would have is, well, you know, is quantitative easing um, something that levitated treasury bond prices, and therefore, now as we embark upon quantitative tightening, are we gonna have the exact opposite? And again, it comes down to the, what MMT will tell you is that there's two sides of the government's operations. The left hand is the monetary side, the right hand is the fiscal side. And there's a reaction function that goes both ways. So if, for example, <coughs> as the Fed begins to reduce its balance sheet, the Treasury would replace that funding by issuing T-bills, then again, quantitative tightening is not a thing. Because even today, you're replacing bank reserves with T-bills, which are functionally the same thing. So, so again, understanding what MMT uh, tells you is that there's more than just one aspect of what the government's doing. There's a fiscal side and a monetary side. And the interaction of the two is what's key, not the independent action of each one. The last slide, and I, I put this up, and, and maybe it's because of the um, President Trump agreement with uh, uh, the Democratic uh, uh, leadership regarding um, U.S. defaults. But this is the credit default swap of the United States, right? Now, this, there's, there's never been a more useless financial product <laughs> than, than this. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it still does trade. And uh, if you ask me a question, I'll tell you why it does. But nonetheless, um, the points I've circled are times where the debt ceiling debate has intensified. So I mentioned kind of uh, summer of 2011, if you recall October of 2013, and most recently uh, in the last kind of four or five weeks, every time you've seen a spike in the U.S. credit default swap index, just in case, just in case the U.S. government is going to default. And again, I would say as, as a practitioner in the marketplace but a student of MMT, you know it's practically impossible. So that's kind of my kind of four examples as a practitioner of why MMT has been useful uh, and, uh, and, and maybe some of the challenges I've had uh, in, uh, in my career, or was it, have some of the challenges I've got as far as imparting this, this, uh, this knowledge uh, into participants given the entrenched uh, thought. Thank you. say one thing. I, I've known Glenn for a while now. He actually was and is one of the largest traders in U.S. government bond markets. His name is well regarded in, in that field. So I, I hope everyone listened very carefully uh, to that presentation. Uh, I'm going to throw it back out there because I think there's a, there's a, there's a very rich uh, uh, area we can talk about here. But uh, does anyone, Mr. Mosler? Let's... I just want to say at one point I, when we were at the Fed, I suggested they buy CDS. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they just keep the price down to five. They make a little money. Not that it matters. And they, they did be proving that international energy is as nice. <laughs> uh, Well, I guess I'll bring up one issue that was touched on a little earlier, and I think a lot of people are. So the unwind of the SOMA portfolio, which you know, to people out here is the system of the market account, which is the Fed's portfolio of, of Treasury and mortgage securities. 
you seem sort of in the middle of the road in terms of what you think the impact on risk premium and so like I mean the Fed articulated clearly that they believe in a portfolio balance channel impact and that's kind of what drove financial asset prices. Do you think there's some truth to that? Do you not think there's some truth to that? Or do you think it's, it's it, as the unwind's coming, there's no point in really spending too much time thinking about that, but rather thinking about what Treasury's going to do as a reaction function? Well, yeah, it's more the latter. At the end of the day, right, it's not what the Fed is doing in isolation. It's the reaction function of the Treasury itself. Yeah. So the Treasury are going to replace that funding with T-bills and allow that second last chart, their average maturity of their debt, to go back down again, then really there's no reaction. There's no, there's no response, right? You've basically replaced a, a bank reserve with a T-bill, which is functionally the same thing. And by the way, in defense of my old department, uh, when we did the maturity extension, we announced that we were doing that. So the Fed could have easily mathematically calculated how much we were doing and just bought more. Yes. Just, just saying. Yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> just to add on to that, isn't there, there's also a duration impact, right? So they're taking away duration when they're buying it from the market and you're saying, well, the Treasury just issued longer, so that's net net. But now if they, they, they unwind the balance sheet, they're actually putting duration back in the market and the mismatch, if they issue bills, there's a duration mismatch, mismatch there. No, it's so, the exact opposite. Okay, so, sorry. Yeah, so, so if, if the, uh, uh, so if the, the Fed has bonds that are going to mature on October 31st, Right, um, so those are now uh, there are six week T bills, right? On October thirtieth, they're going to be one day T bills, right? So if the the Treasury were to issue one day T bills on October thirty first to refinance that Treasury debt with maturity of November first, then really nothing has happened. Yeah. Right? Sorry, you're right. Yeah, because they're not selling the bonds. It's Correct. Just Correct. So it all depends on the Treasury reaction function. Go ahead. So when you when Treasury decided to, when, yeah. was there any thought that that might affect the stock market or change the macro economy? No, the, the thinking was, as long as the announcement was made and yeah, they yeah. stayed regular and predictable, right. all the other actors, including market participants, <coughs> real economy actors, and the Fed, can kind of just move around that. So if the Fed wanted to engage in quantitative easing, and the Treasury has already announced for several years in the future, they're going to be putting this paper out there, yeah. the Fed could, via either Operation Twist or whatever else they were doing, you know, work around that. But you didn't see, nobody did anything except you just did this. You didn't see any. No, the, the, the committee, the borrowing advisory committee did work on it. Did um, they see any macro changes in helping the uh, I don't remember that presentation. Line, Certainly yeah. it wasn't a major consideration. The, I, more, I think, I'm sure there was a It was more the rating, in fact, I was there, I might have talked to you. The rating agencies wanted you to do it, right? Uh, to a piece of rating. No, no, it would have never been done to solely appease the rating right. agencies, right? They would have, it would have, they would have said like they dipped down yeah. well below their normal average. Yeah, yeah. They should be, embark on like an extension, yeah. and then sometimes that takes on a little bit of inertia. Of its there own. was concern about the rating agencies. There was, there was always concern leading up to the downgrade. Right. Right. So, what I'm saying is, your extending is functionally the same as I don't, I don't think there's ever been any thought that. Either one is going to do anything is with regards to the macro economy, with regards to how it's going to fund inflation or anything. I will say that there's some institutional, like the Fed thinks about things like that a lot. Yeah. Treasury, I'm not saying they don't, but yeah. they think about that stuff less. They think about it just like a sure. funding kind of you sure. know, model. Sure. But it was more a financial markets exercise. They wanted to crunch the utility, right? Well, it'll change the curve a little bit. Yep. The yeah. other thing about the unwinding, I, I don't think that it's no different than if the you know, we're just talking about, but there is there is one thing going on here, and that is the uh, mortgage debt, the mortgage portfolio. Correct. Yeah. So I'm talking about the treasury aspect only. The mortgage aspect is a totally different animal. The mortgage You're absolutely right. right. There is that the, the Fed's eating the ball on their portfolio. Right? So how how large a bid for ball did they take out of the market? Does that how far does that go to explain the drop in ball in the market? Yeah. I mean, would it come back? It's my question for you. Do you expect it to come back if they let the mortgage out? If yes. The problem, the problem you have, though, with the mortgage portfolio is there's no maturity. Well, they're 30-year securities, effectively, where the Treasury portfolio uh, has really monthly roll-off, in some cases, bi-monthly roll-off. The Treasury, the, the mortgage portfolio is much more difficult to quantify how it rolls off because it's about prepayments. If rates were to rise, prepayments go to zero, and the, treasury, the, the only deaths, effectively, will roll off the, uh, the mortgage portfolio quicker. So, but, but it won't be, yeah. But if there 
refinance is it's going to pick up somewhere else. Some it's going to be a new one originated. So the, that shrinkage would be a growth in the. Yeah, but the point I'm making is that, is, that, is that if rates all of a sudden go up, the refinancing just goes down down substantially, right? Yeah. So the roll, the natural roll off slows to a crawl. Yeah, but I mean, I'll ask you the where just the idea that this much vol has been taken out of the market now, it's, at some point it's going to be back in. How, how, everybody talks about how low vol is. How much of that is attributed to the idea that Mortgages outstanding to come down there. Yeah, but the Fed owns so a third. One way you can estimate it, remember when Freddie and Fannie were buying all that volume to hedge yeah. that portfolio. So you know exactly how large that portfolio right. was. And in fact, you can look at, uh, yeah. in fact, I'm going to talk about it, the trade. You can look at the 10 year volume relative to some of the others, yeah. and that'll give you an idea of how much it actually is. Yeah. And from, um, I'll check the markets. I haven't recently. Yeah. Do you think it's material? Um, I think. Um, I think it is material, except uh, uh, remember the reason. Uh, let's say, let's say they actually sold mortgages out, but everybody who bought them bought them as an index fund, right? And that is, everybody wants to buy it against the Barclays mortgage. And, and let me just explain this quickly right. to the audience, right? It, I'm, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with the mortgage bond market, but basically, when you own a mortgage, you're effectively what they call short volatility, right? Uh, if rates go up, there's a chance of losing money. If rates go down, there's a chance of losing money because of prepayments. So what a lot of holders of mortgage bonds will do is they will they will end up buying volatility uh, to effectively hedge themselves against this type of unexpected changes or expected changes in markets. So what these gentlemen are talking about is that we've noticed in financial markets a huge movement downward in volatility. And what Warren was alluding to and Sanjay was talking about is this because of the Fed's holding of these mortgage bonds that took away a lot of actors' incentives to trade volatility. Sorry. Yeah, I guess if I could answer your question even a little more specifically, Warren, too, is um, I don't think the QE itself is what drove the asset prices. I mean, QE is a, is a mechanism for signaling in that if we're going to be doing QE for several years, for, let's say, for example, um, the market will basically infer that, well, if they're doing QE, they're not going to be raising rates. And the next inference is, well, if they're doing QE to a certain point in time, they're going to want to see what goes after that. So we'll raise rates for a period after that as well. So the inference when the Fed was doing QE in 2010 was they probably won't raise rates for three or four or five years, which is exactly what happened. So if I knew that rates were not going to go up for four or five years and I was going to have a, effectively a negative real interest rate, right, that's massively bullish for financial asset prices. Um, it flattens the yield curve term structure, and it, by definition, therefore, it raises the, the equity discount premium. So, so that's the point now is that um, what's helping squash volatility isn't so much the mortgage portfolio has left the, uh, the, the street, um, which really has been the forward guidance, not just by the Federal Reserve, but, but by the ECB, uh, a little bit of the BOE, and most impactfully now is the BOJ, who effectively has got a, you know, basically a 10-year you know, yield cap, essentially. So that's really what's coming from. It's not so much a mortgage portfolio, per se. I want to get to one audience question in here. Hi, uh, I have a question that is somewhat more academic. There is a, a new literature that says uh, that since the early 2000s, uh, what we've had in the US is a shortage of safe assets issued by the US government. And because the US government wasn't uh, meeting that shortage, then you had the private sector innovating and, and producing safe as private safe assets through securitization. Then Lehman Brothers collapses, and we have the evidence that the private sector cannot produce safe assets. After Lehman, we have uh, regulatory Basel III and, and changes in collateral requirements in the derivative market, so the safe asset shortage problem is exacerbated. Do you buy that story? No, there, there's no safe asset shortage in the United States. Um, I can tell you why from a simple price channel, right? Um, uh, from uh, the two-year point of the yield curve all the way to the 30-year point, right, those the physical assets, the U.S. Treasuries, trade above the market's expectation of the four Fed funds rate. So you can buy a U.S. Treasury, right, hedge the derivative, or hedge it with the derivative of the four Fed funds rate and get positive carry, get free money, right? If that was the case, there's a legitimate scarcity the other way around. Now, where there is a scarcity is Germany. Why? Because they've got a budget surplus and budget, certain budget, budget balance budget law. And so in that case, you've got German collateral trading substantially below the Eurozone uh, overnight or the ECB's uh, 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 overnight rate, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, deposit rate. So where there is a legitimate scarcity of collateral, such as Germany, that actually occurs. But in the U.S. it doesn't. There's no shortage of collateral. Otherwise, you wouldn't have this, this uh, uh, cheapness of U.S. Treasuries. 
think we have time for one more question. I'm going to get the person in the back. Just... Yep, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm glad we brought up the reaction function because, as I'm sure you noticed as a trader, each time the Fed announced QE, there was a big sell-off in securities. And as they purchased, as they began their actual purchases, the sell-off wasn't fully reversed because the Fed had already announced the quantity of their purchases. Instead of just saying, we're going to target a certain rate, they fixed, they locked themselves in by announcing a quantity. And so each time the purchases ended, there was a big rally in securities because all those participants that said, oh, this is going to be inflationary, realized it wasn't. And so when the Fed stopped buying, there was actually a rally. So all these people's perceptions that the Fed is driving up the driving up uh, prices of government securities is actually somewhat reversed in the actual process because, again, they locked themselves in by saying we're going to buy $80 billion a month instead of actually targeting a higher yield, a, a higher price. Yeah, which is what the Bank of Japan is doing now. Right. Um, they gave up on trying to target uh, quantity and now are basically saying that we want to cap the 10-year rate at zero. Right, and it's not a new thing. That's exactly what the Fed did in, during World War II Absolutely. in the U.S., but they seem to have forgotten that. Correct. All right. Uh, well, thank you for that. We're going to move on to our next panel. Thank you. Hi, does this uh, working good? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, oh, I'd like to first thank uh, the organizers, Stephanie Scott, for inviting me to speak at this conference and also welcome my fellow speakers and attendees. Um, today I'm going to outline three examples of how we at AVM used MNT to first identify and execute profitable trades and almost as importantly not to execute trades that we deem too risky in light of MNT, but which the market may not have seen as such. So um, while discussing one of these trades, I'm, I'm going to suggest that stock flow consistent economic models may be a good way to identify and execute macro trades systematically. I'd like to invite anybody developing real-world SFC models to please contact me as I'm interested in learning and developing techniques on how best to apply these models. Let me briefly introduce myself. I was most recently a partner at AVM, which is a broker-dealer down in uh, Florida. Uh, AVM and its associated hedge fund, Triple focus on fixed income relative value trading. And uh, Warren, it's going to be 35 years soon since you founded it? 20 years since I turned it over to Clay. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I, that long? Wow. Yeah, 1997. Okay. I came, I came to work, uh, I came to the U.S. in 1981 and enrolled, enrolled in the Ph.D. program at Columbia University in Computer Science. I worked on a team led by uh, D.E. Shaw investigating the optimal way to structure and lay out massively parallel computers uh, on silicon. Uh, I had no idea what a bond or a stock was. Never, never even talked about them. Um, I decided to finish my PhD in Cambridge in England. I need to re replenish my finances and on advice from a friend, I read a book on options modeling. Uh, disguised myself as a rocket scientist, and got a job at Lehman Brothers for what I thought would be one year. I was there for nine. Um, I started learning financial modeling from some of the finest researchers at that time, some who were spending sabbaticals, you know, one-year sabbaticals at Lehman Brothers. Um, soon I was, I was asked to build the option models and the risk management systems uh, that, we used to trade, that we used to trade bond options. Later, I was invited to join the trading desk and make option markets on mortgages and bond options, and especially some of the non-standard structures. Um, one day, I got a call from an Italian option trader wanting to know how to price an option on a CCT. Now, a CCT is an Italian government-issued floater. The firm inquiring was a broker dealer called AVM uh, out of West Palm Beach, Florida. Theoretically, a floating rate security issued by a government indexed to a suitably matched short government rate should have zero volatility or very low volatility. I looked at these things and they were moving all around the place. I realized there was something I didn't understand. Um, so rather than put a price on it, I asked the advisor to gracefully miss the trade or offer 
offered the options to to miss. Um, so, and, sorry, so I just want what that literally means is he told his trader give a price that the client's not going to execute on, just so that we don't have to actually do it. Now, don't actually have to do the trade. I don't know how the story <laughs> ended, but but if if I know Warren, he probably lifted that offer anyway, <laughs> right? Uh, do read about the Italian trade in Warren's book, Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds. It's quite, you know, it was really the, uh, the first, I mean, I knew I didn't understand something, and that was what was important in that story. Um, market making, at least with the limited risk limits I was given, can be a tedious and uninspiring job, sorry, Glenn, um, for a researcher. Um, just as I was looking to move on, one of the partners at AVM asked me if I could model an option called a cancelable amortizing swap used to asset swap mortgages. I said I could. I'd actually never traded a swap. And in hindsight, probably was a bit too optimistic. Uh, on my interview with Warren in early 96, 10 year Japanese government bonds were in low threes uh, yield. And the short rates were under 2%. So we're sort of getting down from 7 8% down to lower rates. Um, I've got a slide up here. Um, so I walked into Warren's office, and uh, while Warren used gaps and floors to make this point, um, I'm just using calls and puts just to make the exposition easier. Or uh, He asked me if I thought put call parity holds. And now here I was, uh, you know, I learned some finance. I said, of course, very confident, yes. Well, he said then, so then you'd pay as much for an at-the-money put as you would for an at-the-money call. So I go, yes, right? So then he says, he says, so if the forward 10-year rate in Japan were zero, would you pay as much for a 0% put, that is, betting interest rates go lower, as you would for a call? I said, I looked at him dumbfounded. I was stumped. <laughs> This was 15 years before we saw mildly negative LIBOR rates. You know, my mind, you don't send money to another bank to get negative rates, right? So <clears throat> I, I, was, I must have looked stunned. Anyway, Warren and his partners are graceful enough to offer me a job on the way back to the airport. Okay? On the plane home, I got it. Right? Interest rates, uh, uh, there it is, it's right, last two points. Interest rates can't get to zero unless volatility also does, point Glenn just made. You know, if the government says, I'm going to hold it at zero, that's where it's going to go. Volatility is going to go to zero, and so is the rate. A better way to put it was that volatility must compress as interest rates get lower, uh, if zero is a hard lower bond on nominal rates. And you can see this. Oops, what happened here? Uh, no. Can I go back one slide, please? Yeah. So here's a slide that plots volatility against the rate. Now, when Warren asked me that question, interest rates were, uh, let's say, between 2 and 3%. And so we hadn't seen this part of the curve at all. But what it showed me was, or what it what, it, what, we, what I understood, I took away from it, was is, as you get close to zero, volatility has to compress if zero is a lower bound. Okay? So that's, uh, um, that's one of the reasons I think we have got lower volatility is because of that. You know, the other reason is mortgages, and the other reason, as Glenn pointed out, is uh, you know, we've had guidance that we're going to be low rates for a long time. So that's... that's now, I mentioned this anecdote not because it is directly related to MMT, but because it taught me a few very valuable lessons that are ingrained in me today. One, most people read that as academics, except what they're taught as gospel. And then they build these sophisticated models around them on what might be very flimsy structure. Right? And those structures, those shortcomings may not be apparent the systems under duress, like we got. I mean, you'd ask people about zero rates and, and volatility, you wouldn't have an answer. In fact, people would. But um, when you were duress, you kind of saw that uh, break apart. 
The other thing that I understood was the value of understanding the details at the atomic level. Sort of look at the plumbing. You know, what is, you know, what does the Fed do when they drain reserves? These are questions people sort of don't ask. You know, they've learned, you know, they've learned it. Uh, I mean, I was on a trading desk at Lehman Brothers. Didn't know what that meant, really, truly. So the value of understanding the details at, at an atomic level is profound. Hand, hand waving over those same small details can be deadly, right? And the last thing I learned was, listen very carefully to Warren Mosler. <laughs> His insights can lead to very profitable trades. And I'm, I must have traded just that insight probably five years after that point and made a lot of money doing it. You know, and I can talk about it off, after how we use that uh, to do that. So in the spirit of EF, when Warren Mosler talks, I listen very attentively, okay? So 1998 was the first year since the U.S. came off the gold standard um, that the U.S. government ran a budget deficit. Now, Warren mentioned he's, it's 20 years since he kind of handed over. So by 98, he wasn't in the office that often, as I recall, correct? At the end of 97, it wasn't there anymore. It wasn't there until after. Right. after well, he'd still come in, though. He'd still come in. The following year, there was another budget deficit, and the Congress. So, sorry, surplus. We're mostly private sector deficit. So, private sector yeah, deficit. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, and the Congressional Budget Office was predicting surpluses going forward for years and years, um, and econ economists were printing lengthy research reports, lots of wasted paper in those days because you couldn't just read it on a PDF; they actually mail it out to you. Um, <laughs> On, um, on how there may not be any treasury bonds to buy in a few years. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Those were the days of the bond vigilantes, a term I haven't heard used in a while, right? Um, in 1999, um, Warren used to come in the office. He says he didn't, but he did. And every time he came in the office, he'd take all of our traders, uh, one of the, you know, all of the traders, take them into office and talk to us about how these surpluses were not sustainable. And that sustained surpluses would eventually lead to a recession. That was when he handed me my first copy of South Currency Economics. Recall that I'd never taken an economics course ever. Still haven't. Which in hindsight I consider a huge, huge advantage. <laughs> <laughs> there was some recognition of the profits from the rising stock market especially the NASDAQ, had contributed to the surplus. It also contributed to some sort of wealth effect. So that even while on the margin, the government was siphoning away actual dollars, uh, people didn't feel uh, that poor, it seemed like. Therefore, in some sense, predicting the recession was like predicting the end of the dot-com boom. And a very notoriously difficult task, if you ask me. Anyway, the NASDAQ peaked on March 10, 2000. Crashed from 5,000, now 3,500, bounced back a couple of times to so like 4,000. But at this time, um, uh, it seemed like it was vulnerable. At that time, I was pushing Cliff, Warren's uh, co-founder, to do what we call a relative value trade that invi involved buying and selling options on different parts of the yield curve. Effectively, in my mind, it resembled buying a zero-cost option, zero-cost out-of-the-money call option on a bond, or a put on rate, therefore betting on lower rates. Being the conservative fund we were, I could not get all the partners to agree to the selling of the options. I, okay with buying the options, but don't sell any options. So one day after sitting with Warren and getting the recession warning for the umpteenth time, it struck me that if we, if we went through a recession, at the time all the Fed had in its tool chest was to cut rates. This trade was the ideal expression. If the recession didn't materialize, it was out of the money, everything expired worth, worthless, no harm, no foul. If, in fact, there was a recession, the Fed would cut rates, and I had this call option, free call option. Um, and the nice part of it is I kept asking, when is this recession going to happen, Warren? Well, when the stock market blows up. Well, <laughs> when's that? So, but I had an option, so I had a three-year look into this trade. As soon as I presented like that to Cliff, he did all the hard work. He took the heavy lifting, went to the other part and said, this is the trade we got to do. Okay. So that's where we were. Uh, 
In the middle of 2000, there was a high inflation print, as I recall. I'm not very good at this, but somebody reminded me. And the Fed actually raised rates to 6.5%, middle of 2000, after the NASDAQ. So if you look up there, that's the curve in June of, is it June of 2000, uh, the green curve? Basically flat at 7%, right? Um, I define something called curvature, just to make curvatures as sort of the twice the 10-year yield minus the two-year yield and the 30-year yield. So it sort of measures the curvature of the curve. Uh, and a flat 7% curvature is around zero. Right? Um, now, if you look at, uh, in contrast, the lower curve is the curve in December 2001 after the recession started, after 9-11, and you can see there is curvature to the curve. And in fact, if you measure the curvature of that curve, that's about 200 bips of curvature. Right? The options market, however, in 2000, were predicting that the Fed funds, the Fed cut rates, the yield curve would be approximately linear. See on that second uh, graph over there? Uh, basically, the 10-year volatility, because, because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were buying those 10-year options, were very rich relative to two-year and 30-year options. Um, so this allowed us to set up a trade where, in low rates, if the curvature, the curvature of the curve was higher than minus 20, right, we'd make money. Okay? Now, this is the actual response of what we see over here. So, Minus 20 is around here. So as long as interest rates were below 5% and curvature is above 20, per, uh, uh, above 20 basis points, we'd make money on the trade. So that's why it looked like a call option. So, um, and then let me see if I can get to the, oh, and, and the last slide here. No, that's not it. The next one. And this here shows the profitability of that trade. It's actually a little conservative in the sense that I've used uh, plus 20 curvature rather than minus 20. Uh, but it also assumes you hold the, uh, the trade till expiration, which, we, which is kind of difficult to do. So, so here's, um, last week I asked Cliff about this trade to remind me, he's very good at this, and he said this one trade actually made between Triple I and some of our clients made $750 million in 2001, 2002. In fact, all the way to 2003. Back when that was a lot of money. That, I, I was gonna, that's in my notes here. As Warren would say, back when that was a lot of money. So to trade profitability using MMT, you need the following. You need to understand MMT almost as a religion, and therefore its implications, right? Sustained sur surpluses will eventually lead to a recession. You gotta understand that and understand what delays it. The high stock market, for example. Gauge the market response and timing. Remember there may be multiple feedback loops uh, operating at different time scales. Actually, Glenn pointed out a very interesting fact, I'm sure, I guess, a lot of MMTers know this, which how the budget deficit really is a desire. You know, you, the government may plan the budget deficit, but eventually, in the long term, it's the desire of the private sector to save, right? That's a feedback loop in equilibrium, but you've got to understand that. And you may never get there, by the way. So, um, Three, predict the central bank and fiscal policy responses, which are obviously usually slower than central bank responses. So you've you got to have a, you know, it's a game theoretic thing going on. This is what MT predicts. This is what the Fed's going to do. This is what the Treasury is going to do. This is what the tax situation is going to do. So it, it sort of becomes a game theoretic approach there. Develop a trading strategy that profits when you predict co correctly and minimizes losses when your predictions are not accurate. And then you repeat these two or four, these steps repeatedly because the market dynamics are changing all the time. I do believe that stock flow consistent models will be very useful in predicting the impact and timing of these responses, along with modeling the virtuous negative feedback loops of fiscal balance. Um, a situation where we were able to avoid problems was when Warren pointed out that the euro was technically not a fiat currency, and therefore a sovereign government bond denominated in euro had potential credit risk. 
and should, not, should be treated as such. Uh, I point all of you to a note written by Warren in May of 2001 titled Rites of Passage. Rites of Passage. Uh, it was a remarkably prescient uh, of the great crisis that occurred recently. I mention this only because Stephanie was not aware of this uh, piece till recently, right? Uh, in particular, sorry. Just so we have enough time for questions. Yeah. Short okay, I'll do the okay, last bit. For all of us, AVM, it was clear that QE was not inflation. The Fed bu buying the bonds of the Treasury issued was operationally equivalent to Treasuries not issuing them. The extra reserves in the system were not going to allow banks to lend any more than they would otherwise. Right? We knew, we knew that loans create deposits. Um, at the end of the day, the banks were looking to the Fed to pay them a 25 bit interest on reserves. If anything, lowering the risk, interest rates is fiscally, is fiscally contractionary. In addition, the Fed buying coupon, coupon bonds and paying them 25 basis points on reserves is further contractionary. With the Fed targeting the number of bonds to buy and not the price, suggests that the bond yields would on average fall. Okay? The only mechanism we saw that we had some faith in was asset price inflation. People first guy who sold the bonds wanted to buy something else, so he bought some corporate bonds instead. And that person who sold him the corporate bonds bought a high-yield bond. The person selling the high-yield bonds bought the equities. And the guy selling the equities was back in reserves. Right? So all we saw was a little bit of what I thought was uh, asset price inflation. In fact, Glenn showed it. So I think there is some causality there somewhere. Uh, um, a number of equity hedge funds were worried about the money supply or the government printing money resulting in runaway inflation and therefore impacting their long equity positions adversely. Rather than buy equity puts, they reasoned they were worried about inflation and the ideal expression was for them to buy bond puts. And, they, and as they did not understand convexity, they chose a structure that guaranteed them a fixed payout at a certain rate. So for example, on $1 million of interest rates reach 8% which is hard to do with bonds, but they did the structure. Anyway, some of these funds had done very well in 2008, had a lot of capital, and they made outsized trades distorting the options skew market. Rather than go into the details of the trade, let me tell you that basically, we didn't do too much of it because it involved selling out of the money options, uh, but we used some of this uh, insight to put on a profitable trade. Uh, one last question to address to my fellow uh, practitioners, having found religion or otherwise MMT, I personally see it as a moral obligation to proselytize and educate the general public, including my uh, uh, other practitioners and most importantly policymakers. For example, I no longer write a check to a congressman or senator unless they sit down with me to discuss the economy and therefore MMT. I'd, uh, I'd suggest two other ways. As Warren used to say, you can tell them the two, they just don't believe you. Right? Okay, thank you. Can we have time for a, a quick question or two? Uh, Sanji? Has Sorry, I wrote oh, that. Oh, please. It's very, very, it's good to hear her yeah. phrase. <laughs> very good detail. What's that? Okay, sure, sure. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of kick it off. Um, uh, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that trying to predict something like a you know, recessionary environment is much like trying to predict the call the end of the dot com bubble. Mm -hmm. But given the fact that you were, you were using the government securities market and you just needed to kind of receive uh, fixed rates, it was one where you could actually wait it out, uh, mostly unless you're using like options. And, you know, there was, there's the decay. So I guess I'm kind of curious, like from an investment perspective, uh, it seems like there should always be some type of shock value of carrying positive carry securities like, like you know, U.S. Treasuries, yeah. uh, if you expect that you know the surplus deficit thing is out of whack. Is that something you'd agree with, or or not? Um, uh, yes, I mean, I think you know. Remember, we were what is called a relative value sure. trading yeah, firm. Yeah, so uh, we weren't really there to take bets, yep. right? And in fact, the trade I presented was a relative value trade. Options were expensive, options were cheap, sell the expensive, buy the cheap. Technically, it was supposed to be a market neutral trade. But there's a view behind that. 
Well, that's how I sold it, right? Because <laughs> uh, uh, in some sense, yes, there was a view behind the trade. That's why my partners agreed to do the trade. After 97, the uh, risk profile changed. Uh, right, right. So, so, so yes, I could have just bought options, or I could just go long the market. Long the market it was flat carry, and yes, once they cut, it became positive carry. So you could, but the market, the mark to market volatility had been very, very high. Okay, and remember, if you'd done it too early, yep. they actually raise rates. Yeah. Right. So you have to be right. Uh, to the broader audience participants. Oh, so uh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So this firm was started by a guy named Ike Van Arlen, who was a uh, we knew from uh, Hart when I worked in Hartford, Connecticut with Cliff, and Ike was there at. Uh, <coughs> so anyway, he then went to New York, and he, and he told his story later about what happened to him. So he was. Coming uh, back from work, and he's get, trying to get on the subway. He's never heard of this one. No, he's I'm getting on the subway. And he feels his wallet. <laughs> he feels somebody bump him from behind, and he reaches down, and his wallet's gone. Okay, so and he sees a guy running in front of him, so he runs after him. Okay, and he and he the guy jumps on the subway ahead of him, and he can't make it, so he grabs his arm and holds it and rips the sleeve off the guy's shirt, and the guy gets away with his wallet. Okay, anyway, he goes home. Says, and his wife says, how's your day today? He says, oh, you know, somebody, uh, oh, no, his wife, he goes home and his wife says, how's your day today? I, was it, did you have any problem because you left your wallet at home? That's <laughs> 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 uh, There was one question I saw right in the back that uh, uh, what, what was the name of the firm? Uh, just a quick one. Everyone, yeah. You talked about how uh, you're trying to teach MMT to other uh, financial markets and so forth. Um, looking from the outside, one might think that MMT is a competitive advantage for you in the markets. And so I'm wondering about, okay, so if all of the, all of the folks in the financial markets get MMT, do you guys make more money or less? Uh, so the question is, if MMT is a competitive advantage, <laughs> Uh, do you make more money or less? Well, look, it's, you know, people make money for all sorts of reasons. Uh, the guy who bet, the, uh, the guy who made, uh, I think it was Paulson, made tons and tons of money in 2008 because he predicted the housing crisis, was the guy buying inflation protection and spending crazy amounts of money. So the point is, you can make lots of money for lots of reasons. The thing is, can you do it in a, in a, in a, in a fashion, uh, like I said, MMT gives you some guidance, not on every trade, but on lots of different situations. I chose three of them. Once you have that, you still need to, to translate that into a trade. And as, as Amar pointed out, you know, unless you're a betting person, which I'm not, right? Um, I'd rather structure the trade properly. The last inflation trade in particular, I didn't do a lot of it because I couldn't structure it just right to be low risk, and give me the sort of returns I wanted. I don't know if I answered your question, though. Is that? Well, I, I'm just curious what, because you, know, you, you trade a certain, you do a certain way, and I, yeah, I get your point that they, they um, there's less of the risk of money. I'm just thinking of it sort of, sort of um, to help others understand um, where you're coming from in the sense of, is it a competitive advantage? Is it, um, I, oh. Oh, look, look, look at Glenn. I mean, he was uh, head of trading at Morgan Stanley. Is as, as, as you know, has made a lot of money. I, I bet some of it's from uh, understanding MMT. Right. Well, so that's what I was saying. Is, is Glenn mentioned that he's, he's given this talk about a hundred times. If they all listen, <laughs> <sighs> I, I would just say to that the the results in understanding MMT are reflected in market prices. So somebody's making money, right? So if you look at uh, you know. Yield curves, or the you know the ten-year yield falling. Glenn's you know he's a big buyer in there, and he's making money. His yields go down. So the individual retail guy who's trying to bet against that, maybe he's getting he's losing his money. That's the right. Market's moving, so a good majority of the participants are are in line with it. 
my first job at AVM, in fact, was trying to find a way to short Japan uh, in, in a less than negative carry framework. Well, you know, 20 years later, I'd still have that job. I mean, right? I mean, we're going to move on to our next panels, but just to that one point, the one actual wonderful thing about markets is, is that um, you, know, you, you will either do well or not do well, and you'll try to re-examine why you did well and why you didn't do well, and you're not really stuck in any kind of particular ideology unless you want to be. So given the last few years where we're seeing government bond yields in the U.S. go, and then obviously what's happened in Japan and the number of people who tried to short Japan, these are painful lessons to learn, especially the Japan uh, 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 perspective. So I think markets learn. Uh, you know, do they learn fast enough? Who knows? That's another question. Um, so I want to introduce our next panelist. Uh, well, whoever has already been introduced, but just can speak for himself. So uh, what can I say that hasn't been said, I guess, is the, uh, I'm going to take a different ap approach on this. Um, we're a different type of shop. I, I think the panel is phenomenal in the sense that we got a lot of different perspectives. So we got the equity side. Glenn, from the more hedge fund side, they'll be shorter term focus, the option side of things. Our shop is traditional, long only money manager, and we have very long holding periods. So we're not trading the market on a daily basis. And so our view, you know, how I use MMT in our shop is much more looking at long-term trends. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, a bit today. So you've, you've all seen, you know, the, the hype around, uh, you know, debt deflation, federal debt deflation uh, crisis. And that leads to the guy on the bottom right, which is supposed to be me, but you're stressed, right? It creates stress, Negative, negativism creates stress, it sells, uh, sells stories. Uh, I think it's the other one, right? Oh, there it is. So, with all that negativism, why do we experience this in the UK? And I had, so debt to GDP is the um, blue line and the red line is 10-year generic federal yields. Um, and we could only go back as far as this. I'm sure there's more data you can go back further, but in the uh, interest of time, we went back this far. So, you know, I'm looking at the market, and I switched shops in 1997. And the new shop I went to, the bond manager there said, bonds are done, I'm going to become an equity manager. And I said, well, maybe they're done, maybe they're not done, I don't know, but you know, 200 years of interest rate history in the United States, and right now we're above average at that time in 1997. But it, it kind of made me think, and I knew this relationship, so you got the UK there, you got Japan there, you know, debt to GDP goes up, yet interest rates go down, and then you got the US uh, here. So I, I knew that was going on, but I was saying, you know, it's fine and dandy, and I know that valuation-wise, long-term history, the rates are higher than they, they, they were in the past. But I, I didn't know why, so I was kind of asking myself, well, why? Well, there's more to this than the debt side of it. That, that's not what drives interest rates. It's got to be the fundamentals, the economic fundamentals, so it's got to be growth and inflation. So I knew, I, I said, okay, well, it's got to be that. But I think the MMT gave me kind of the intellectual understanding in terms of why that is, why that debt to GDP is not important, and why the economic fundamentals are much more important. And when Scott asked the question about the, the last question, to me it's about conviction. When you're managing money, right, and you're, you're, if you have much more conviction, what gives you the conviction? It's the intellectual rigor that you exercise when you're going through your analysis and the stronger you feel about that intellectual rigor, the, more, the higher conviction you have mm -hmm. and the more successful trades. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You said the debt to GDP ratio is not the fundamental driver of Economic fundamentals, so growth and inflation. Yeah. Um, so that that's what where MT really helps. One is cutting out the noise, cutting out the stress, but also it gives you that conviction that you need when you're managing money. So for us, it was really the long-term trend in interest rates 
you know, are the, do I worry about, you know, the, the debt side or the, the deficit side? No, and now I understand why I don't have to worry about it. So when you look at a typical bond uh, manager, he's looking at interest rate exposure, so duration, uh, yield curve, spread risk. So I can, uh, you know, overall, in the U.S., the market's a little different, a lot more MBS. In Canada, you have a lot more corporate bonds. So I can over-allocate spread products, so corporate bonds. That's a traditional money manager is going to look at it that way. And then there's obviously default risk with individual securities. Liquidity risk is a bit more of an issue now. So interest rate risk management can make or break a bond manager's <coughs> career. So what drives long-term interest rates? Long-term interest rates, short-term rates, and then your forward rate. And the forward premium different it, it determined by inflation growth and then the term premium. And term premium has changed a lot, or fluctuated a lot, I should say, in the last few years. And that's like even this year, you look at it and say in the last couple months, people were surprised the U.S. yields went down. And when you break out exactly why the yields went down, you can't attribute a lot to economic fundamentals, but you can attribute a lot to the term premium and whether it's geopolitical risks and things like that. But you've seen you it. Want to define term premium for the, the oh, if you add up all the short-term interest rates uh, along the curve, so short three-month rate, three-month rate, and you go out to 10 years, you add all that up, what's left over, that's your term premium. Okay, so it's what the market demands to, to go out to 10 years beyond uh, just uh, adding up all the short rates. That's the layman's term, right? I think that. Um, so what do we do when, we've, when we're managing bond portfolios? One is we look at the long-term valuation. So we say, okay, corporate bonds spread risk. You know, valuations right now, spreads are fairly tight. That's great. Evaluation's a terrible timing tool. So what am I going to use for timing? I want to know when there's going to be a recession. I don't know when there's going to be a recession, right? All I can say is leading economic in indicators are pointing up, pointing down, strong, weak, whatever, you'll always get shocks. So if the leading economic indicators are fairly strong, my recession risk model is going to be fairly low. And I'm not an academic. I'm not creating these models. It's an art, not a science in my mind. And I'm going to look at it and say, okay, well, now my risks are higher. So as a risk manager, I'm going to take down the, uh, the risk in the portfolio from a credit perspective. So that's how we use uh, leading economic indicators. The best we can get is say, you know, if we can even be, there's, there was a, a paper published, uh, I used it in one of our ASIMIX presentations just a couple weeks ago, so it was recently published, and it was looking at timing, and I think Siegel did a study, Jeremy Siegel, back in the early 1990s, and determining, using business cycles to decide asset mix. And he showed that you can add, even if you're just coincident, with the trough in the business cycle and you switch from bonds to stocks at the trough, you would add about 200 basis points to your performance, long-term performance, uh, by doing that. And then that, that study has been updated more recently and they came out with similar, uh, similar numbers. So the business cycle is important. I'm also, I run our asset mix committee, so we do use this, uh, this framework uh, quite a bit. So I, I would say the MMT is also, you know, using that sectoral balance framework, that also helps you in determining, you know, um, the, uh, the economic momentum uh, and the inflation outlook as well. And again, cutting out the noise helps in your, uh, in your analysis. Um, so, you know, Keynes emphasized short-term interest rates is the, he, he said you can't predict, you know, what the, what the long-term rates are gonna look like, but if you were gonna determine uh, long-term interest rates, you might as well look at short-term interest rates. And what determines short-term interest rates, the central bankers are a big part of that, and what motivates them. So even though their framework is wrong, I have to understand how they're thinking and why it's wrong, and then MMT obviously helps me with that. With that. Now, as luck would have it, this paper came out last week. <laughs> So, and they're actually presenting this afternoon. I think Lee is here uh, presenting this afternoon, this paper, but kind of empirical proof of uh, what I thought, you know, in terms of what's the most important determinants 
uh, for long-term interest rates. And essentially, uh, they're saying that the, the fiscal side of it is, it, it does change things, but it's not the most important. It's one of the least important factors uh, out there. You see the bottom, uh, bottom bullet there in terms of uh, the impact on uh, fiscal balance on, on interest rates. So anyways, you can get more of that uh, this afternoon at the, uh, this presentation. So you, if long-term interest rates are determined by short-term interest rates, and if you think Yellen's going to get uh, reappointed, then rates will probably stay low. <laughs> How tall is uh, Gary? <laughs> he's, he's, he's really tall. Oh. He's very, very tall. You, you want Bob Rush. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, you know, I, I joke, could it be so simple? But, um, you know, the, the point is really that you're focused on the short-term interest rates, what drives those short-term interest rates, and not all the noise, uh, you know, about the debt and deficit side, federal debt and deficit side of things. Well, right, yeah. Please go ahead. So you talk about leading economic indicators uh, a moment ago. Are there any... Uh, key elements of those within that broader subset that you particularly pay attention to? The traditional one is yield curve. So that's, that's, there's been numerous studies in terms of that's your, uh, if you had only one to pick, that would probably be the one that you're looking at. There's a lot of debate, you know, even prior to 2007, uh, 2008 recession, you know, every time the leading, in, or the, the yield curve starts to flatten, the market comes out with these excuses why it's different this time. And then each time it seems to, it seems to have an impact. But I would, again, I would say leading economic, leading economic indicators, that framework is an art, not a science. And every single recession, there's something different that takes you down. So it's, it's, it's not that easy. And I, could, I don't mind posting, you know, tons, and you can get them for free now those leading economic indicators and that they got even Atlanta Fed now and now casting is is very common guys had you know careers based on predicting what the economy and that's kind of washed out now because it's all all that stuff is free but uh, PMIs are you know more manufacturing side but it, it's it's real time but I think the best you can do is now cast right I think you know in terms of value add you're not there to predict as a money manager, you can't, because nobody knows the future. That's the first thing in our research meetings. You know, the mentality you have is you're not trying to predict the future because nobody can. So, so to, to that point about the yield curve as an indicator, of, uh, uh, we had a question earlier about what the Bank of Japan was doing of effectively yield curve targeting. Um, so, you know, I guess on one hand, you know, central bank can do yield curve targeting. On the other hand, there is information in the curve as, as you alluded to, so, I mean, if, if that model was ever used by the Fed, uh, if things were in a certain state where they needed to yield curve targeting, does that mean all information sort of goes away from the curve, in your opinion? Yeah, but, uh, Glenn made a really good point when he was, you know, talking about the information in the curve to your, to your answering your question, right? Um, so, it's, I, th I think when you have an unnatural influence, so there's not a an actor in the market that's profit motivated or you know their careers on the line or something like that um, that distorts things so <coughs> I, w I have to think the information value of that yield curve is distorted when you have heavy-handed unnatural actors in the marketplace now with the central bankers we can say well why are they doing that you know what's their modus operandi and things like that and it's all part of they just see it as another tool uh, they can exercise to stimulate the economy and get inflation back up, but uh, whether it works or not. The, the one thing I'll just add as a side note, I always remember, I can't remember who, you guys know way better than me, but um, back in the 1930s, the thought was fix the economy first and the financial markets will fix themselves. And I always wondered why the Fed this time around was like fix the financial markets and the economy will fix itself. So it was backwards. And that, to me, was so simple. And they never, I never heard anything. I don't know if you guys heard anything contrary to that, but it seemed backwards in terms of what they did. Two things. First, the information curve is largely the assessment of the 
Fed's reaction to that. So it, it's a re market reaction. You know how much information, how valuable is that? Where they're guessing where your reaction is. It's, it's, it's actually, yeah, the reaction functions that are trying to predict what they'll do to market reaction. But in uh, 1999, uh, Robert Maxwell, this British uh, businessman, who died, and his you know, 401ks, he, he'd sort of been uh, uh, siphoning off some money from the 401ks. And so, in response to that, the British government said, well, now you have to, everybody has to, um, to buy, to, to basically not their 401 ks their pensions. Their pensions, so, yeah, the index. So and they have to now buy bonds to, 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 uh, to, to match their uh, duration. Yep. Uh, Long-term yields fell about 200 basis points in the next month or two. Well, how much information? I mean, do we really expect uh, rates to come down 30 years from now, 200 basis? No. <coughs> no, there is information there, but uh, I think it's all worked out. Uh, and yeah, I want, now we can just sort of have a broader discussion, but you know, we've been waiting for all the things we need done. Well, yeah, so on a related note to this discussion, how do you think about the term premium? Because if you look at, for example, the Federal Reserve's term structure models, they show that you know the vast majority of the variation in interest rates is just this so-called term premium. Uh, what does that mean? I don't know what it means. <laughs> I mean, that's the way they look at it. Term, term premium is a, uh, the example I just gave in 1999. What happened was suddenly, if you were put into jail, if you as a pension fund manager did not match the duration of your liabilities, suddenly a long bond had no risk, right? So it, dep it really depends on what you define as term premium. If, if you are a 20 year old and you're trying to buy a security that's 30 years, that's less risky for you, right? What you're thinking of is, is, is liquidity risk, right? And most people can say, well, you buy T-bills, it's riskless. Well, yes, it is, unless you've got inflation, right? So term premiums are very, uh, 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 people in the bond market talk about it that way. But what happened in 1999 in the UK was the term premium turned negative for long-dated bonds. People's academic careers have been built around term premium papers. So. Like, it's, <laughs> it's almost like potential GDP. Like, what is that, right? right. So it's like, what is term premium? Is that's, that, that's why I say I don't know. Like, okay. it's, if you look at the volatility of the long end, are you, really, are you really suggesting that we have that much information on what's going to happen over the next 30 years, right? No, it's term premium changing, if that's what you want to call it. But that's a kind of catch-all. It's like the spreads. <coughs> uh, spreads are moving. Well, why are they moving? Uh, well, the term premium is changing. So it's, it's kind of a, a catch-all <laughs> phrase for, for stuff. And it doesn't have to be increasing the maturity or duration. It can be decreased. Yeah. So we don't know. No, okay. no we don't know. Right. Yeah. Uh, question in the back? So it's just a catch-all phrase. I'm asking this partially as somebody who's been in the mortgage business for 30 years. Um, the LIBOR is going to be replaced, and um, they haven't announced what they're going to replace it with. And I'm just wondering if there's any ideas among those of you who know more about this than I do. They, they, they've announced, uh, uh, they've announced a, a replacement rate. Uh, that the Fed is supposed to be publishing soon, which is supposed to be based on secure repo transactions. Uh, so it's, it's, I don't think they've published it yet, but it's going to be real-time data that, that they've collected and they're going to publish about what the overnight rate is to lend against a portfolio of government securities. So, which is probably a more useful rate than LIBOR actually was. So I, I don't think it's fully in place yet, but like, that's what they're going to do in the U.S. In the Europe, I think it's going to be the unsecured rates of Eonia and Sonia that are going to be, uh, uh, which also are going to be collected real-time data. So that's not just people saying it's the rate. It's going to be the actual transacted rate. So we'll see how it goes in the next couple of years. It's only, it's only a several trillion dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can 
consultant who works in public utilities regulation, and I work on behalf of ratepayers for the return on equity segment of rate cases, uh, working for ratepayers against the company witnesses who are always predicting ROE needs one and a half to two percent higher than I do. And I've noticed about a year and a half, two years ago, there would be this paragraph in their testimony that would say, the uh, Fed balance sheet is $4.8 trillion now. Forgive me if I'm wrong about what's after the decimal point, but something in that range. And it, in 2008, it was $800 billion. Uh, they're going to unwind, and as of Wednesday, they're going to say they started to unwind. Uh, therefore, interest rates are going to go up, and uh, stock share prices are going to go down, which actually, in the an analytical, the DCF formula causes the ROE to go up. What, I, what I'm picking up today is, you have to look at what the Treasury does as well as what the Fed does, and what can I use on behalf of ratepayers from what you're saying today to make that point clear. Uh, sorry, Glenn. Uh, I'm not too yeah, sure that you're, if I can clarify. I think Glenn was saying rates don't change based on Yeah, so, so what you can do to try and observe this is every quarter the Treasury announces its public borrowing estimates. And they generally break it out um, uh, or it's inferred between coupon bonds and T-bills. Right, so uh, it'll be, this will be on uh, the last Wednesday of October is going to be the next one that comes out. And they're going to announce their expected borrowings for the quarter and the expected T-bill issuance for the quarter. So you'll know that because you have expected balance sheet runoff that occurs starting in October, and you can go and look in the SOMA portfolio as to how much securities they have that mature on October 15th and October 31st, you can back into, is a T-bill stock going to increase or not? Right, and if that's the case, there's really kind of no impact on rates. Or, conversely, is the Treasury going to change its, uh, its coupon borrowing, its, its uh, mature, uh, the longer date of maturing issuance? And that's, again, uh, all going to be published on, uh, uh, it'll be, it should be the last, uh, the last Wednesday of October. And, and they'll probably actually even more explicitly. Because, because of this extraordinary time. A lot time. of people are going to be looking at it. So in their press release and their statement, they're probably going to say, the Federal Reserve announced X. Our reaction function is likely to be Y. With a lot of like, but in case this doesn't happen, this doesn't happen, we reserve the right to be flexible. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what's going to happen. Maybe you wrap up. Is there one more thing? Yeah, sure. Okay. Please. So I just want to make clear um, to Scott's question about, is MMT a competitive advantage? In, in my mind, it actually just explains the rules of the game. So if, you, if you're playing basketball and you don't understand what uh, you know, a travel is, and you step on the court and you travel, well, you're out of the game. Um, so from my perspective, the less people that understand the rules of the game, the less competition I have. But that doesn't make me a better basketball player. It doesn't make me win the game or score a lot of points. So I think that's the analogy you'd want to use. Okay. So. I think with that, we're out of time, unless someone has a real burning question that, that they... All right, well, everyone will be around anyway.